Hello and welcome to the Oxford German Classic Podcast. My name is Karolina von Troba and I'm a graduate student in the subfaculty of German here at Oxford. I also coordinate our essay competition for six formers, which is called a German Classic. And the aim of this podcast is to get you to engage more closely with our set text for this year. And our set text is Der Sandmann by Itia Hoffmann which is a very eerie and mysterious short story written over 200 years ago in 1816. But before I tell you a bit more about Der Sandmann, I'd like to introduce my guest today, Professor Joanna Neely, who is a tutor in German at St. Peter's College. So Joanna, can you tell us a bit more about yourself? So maybe where about you're from, how long you've been at Oxford? Okay, um, well, I come from Northern Ireland. Um, I've been at Oxford on and off for about 15 years. I was an undergraduate student here and I came back again in 2012 where I started teaching German here and I've been at St. Peter's College uh, for two years now as tutor in German. Mm -hmm. And um, you are an expert on Hoffmann. Your first book is called ETA Hoffmann's Orient, Romantic Aesthetics and the German Imagination. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a bit more about your current research? Um, yes, yeah, so Hoffmann was my is my first love really in German literature, and at the, um, as one of the major Romantic writers, um, I find him absolutely fascinating, and I'm still interested in the Romantics. So I'm currently looking at Romantic writers, including Hoffmann, and what I'm particularly interested in now is their relationship, I suppose, to the wider world. So how the German Romantics engage um, via translation or via creative imagination with cultures outside of their own and with what you might call world literature. Um, but certainly a side interest is, is Hoffmann's engagement with artificial life, which we're going to get to today. Yeah, exactly. So today I'll have a chat with Joanna about the figure of automaton or mm. mechanical doll in mm. Der Sandmann. Let me set the context a bit first. So the story is told by a narrator who introduces himself as a friend of our mm. protagonist, uh, Nathanael, who is a young student. And as a child, Nathanael used to be very much afraid of the Sandman, yeah. which is a character in folk tales who puts children to sleep. And Nathanael came to associate this figure of the Sandman with a friend of his father. Mm -hmm. And this friend used to visit their house in the evenings and he was really scary. Um, and that's how Nathaniel developed the association mm -hmm. between um, Coppelius, because that was the name of, the, of his father's friend, and the Sandman. And now, many years later, Nathaniel meets another man whose name is Coppola, mm -hmm. and he gets it into his head that Coppola and Coppelius are, in fact, the same person. But everybody around him, so his fiancée Clara, her brother Lothar, they all assure him that it cannot be true, they can't be the same person. And we find out about all this from three letters yeah. that Nathaniel, Clara and Lotta exchange between each other. And these letters form roughly the first third of the story. And it is only then that the narrator comes in and takes us deeper into the strange and wondrous mm -hmm. aftermath of Nathaniel's meeting with um, Coppola. And it is only really in the last third of the story that we find out more about two new important characters in Nathaniel's life, a professor of natural sciences called Spallanzani mm -hmm. and his daughter Olympia. So Joanna, could you briefly walk us through what we find out about Spallanzani mm. and Olympia at this point? Yeah, so it's all very interesting. So Nathaniel, as you say, has become obsessed with this idea that Coppola is some kind of evil influence in his life, just like Coppelius from his childhood. Um, but he's gone home to visit Clara, his fiancée, and Lothar, her brother, um, and, and he seems to, to do better eventually after this visit home. So back he comes, and he's, he's a student, he's in a university town, he comes back to that university town, and... Um, by some strange, mysterious chance, his, um, his student lodgings have been burned down um, and he has to move. And when he moves in his new accommodation, he finds he's across the road from this beautiful girl um, who distracts him all the time, distracts his attention from thinking about his fiancée Clara, presumably distracts him from his studies too. He just <laughs> gazes at her through the window and particularly through a spyglass that he's bought from Coppola. 
So that's Olympia. That's, that's you're Olympia, talking about, right? absolutely. And she's sitting in the window. Um, and it turns out she's the daughter of Professor of Natural Sciences, Professor Spallanzani. Um, and eventually Spallanzani throws a ball, um, partly to welcome Olympia into society. And Nathaniel, of course, is keen to have every dance with her at the ball. Won't let anyone else dance with her, won't dance with anybody else. Yeah. He's absolutely um, overwhelmed with desire for her. And nobody else can quite understand why this is, because they can't put their finger on it, but there's just something a bit strange about her. She's a bit cold, or she dances almost too perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, there's just something a little bit off about Olympia, and mm -hmm. some of them think she's um, a bit idiotic, perhaps, or that she doesn't have much kind of independent thought. Others just find her very strange. Yeah. So why is Nathaniel so infatuated with her? But he doesn't listen to this and he, he goes to visit her regularly. He reads his poetry to her. He's, he's, every time he reads his poetry to her, he sees the confirmation of his own poetic <laughs> right. love and, and the brilliance of his own poetic genius, something Clara had not appreciated. Um, and eventually he decides he's going to ask for Olympia's hand in marriage and off he goes to seek Spallanzani's permission. Whereupon we have the big revelation, so it's a plot spoiler now, um, when he gets to Spallanzani, he finds Spallanzani in an argument with, it turns out, Coppola, and they're fighting over Olympia, and it turns out that Olympia is in fact an extremely sophisticated automaton. Spallanzani has created her body and all the mechanics, Coppola has created the eyes. So there's some sense that Spallanzani maybe owes Coppola something that he's not given him, or vice versa, but anyway, they fight over this doll, Olympia, her eyes burst out in front of Nathaniel, who then perhaps quite understandably is carted off to the tall house, to the insane asylum. Mm -hmm. And the story doesn't quite end there, but that's the huge revelation of the heart of Desat and Man, that this yeah. wonderful woman has simply been a very sophisticated automaton, mm -hmm. so a robot, basically. Yeah, um, let's talk a bit more about what an automaton actually is, right? And mm. And why were they so popular in Europe around 1800? So um, an automaton, in the, in the simplest definition, is really just any kind of machine that can perform some sort of function. So a robot doesn't necessarily have to be, obviously, a robot that imitates a person. But I think what we're looking at here is a particular type of automaton, so a mechanical creation that mimics human life. Um, which is obviously a fascinating topic because it opens up the question of what is human life and what's the difference between us and a very convincing replication of us. If we can't tell the difference, is there such a difference? And certainly even before Hoffman's work, um, this trope was extremely popular in literature, the creation of artificial life. Um, a couple of years after Der Sandmann, of course, we think of Frankenstein as well. Um, but before Der Sandmann, through the 18th century, there was a cultural fascination with automata. Um, so just two examples I could pick out. Um, the first one from France um, in the 1730s. Um, a man called Jacques de Vosconson Vos Vos um, invented, um, well, he invented several automata, but his most successful one was a, a duck that yeah. seemed to be able to digest food. Yeah. And this duck was an absolute sensation. and People came to look at it and, and wonder at how this, this thing that they knew was an automaton, that's the difference between them and Nathaniel, but how can it mimic life, the biological process of digestion, so that was one really interesting example. There's another example that Hoffman actually takes up in a different story called Die Automata, um, which is, um, was a mechanical Turkish chess player invented by a man called Wolfgang Kempelen in the 1770s. And this chess player, this again, everybody knew it was an automaton, but it... it it got taken on tours around Europe. It played chess with statesmen such as Napoleon and Benjamin Franklin. It defeated them. It was a complete wonder. Um, it had, uh, yeah, sort of, yeah, toured Europe and various European countries. And there was this question of how can this thing that we know to be artificial have intelligent life? So this is a step forward from the digesting duck, which mimics a human bio or an animal biological function to something that seems to be able to think independently and intelligently. Now, actually, it was a dupe, but it looked very successful. Yeah. It seemed to be able to think its way through complex strategies while playing chess. And this really opens up this question, again, of, of, of the mimicking of intelligent life. Mm -hmm. um, 
And yeah, and this is absolutely a time of scientific exploration, of technological progress, um, and of fears about technological progress. Um, and I suppose the question lingers in the background too about man playing God, um, which becomes an interesting question around the Enlightenment with increasing secularization in Europe as well. So there's the question of, of religion, of creation, of yeah. intelligent life, of what makes us human. Mm -hmm. These are questions that still fascinate us today, I think, as well. Um, for example, you can think about our fear at the moment of bots and fake news and, and how can we tell who's who online. Yeah. So it's a question that has really kind of troubled us, I think, um, through the centuries. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, and what do you think is so interesting about how Hoffman approaches this question? What is his spin on the automaton? Mm. How is Olympia different, for example, from the duck and well, the turk yeah. that you've told us about? Um, well, I suppose the major difference um, with Olympia um, and the two examples I've referenced are that with these two historical examples, people knew they were automata and they knew they were mechanical structures. They just couldn't quite work out how despite this they seemed so clever, so can mechanical life mimic human life? Um, Spallanzani, of course, tries to pass off Olympia as a real human being, and he succeeds quite far. People find her strange, but they don't quite work out what it is that's wrong with her. And Hoffman pits this modern scientific creation of mechanical life against something that happens much earlier in the text, in Nathaniel's childhood, mm -hmm. and this is when... Coppelius and Nathaniel's father seem to be involved in some kind of magic experiment where they're trying to create maybe homun a homunculus. So they're trying to breathe spirit somehow magically into something and create life there. So Spallanzani sets out to create something mechanical that mimics human life. Earlier in the tale, Coppelius tries to magic up a life force. So there are sort of two discourses or two, two, two ideas going on about, about how we could possibly create artificial life. One would be through magic, mm -hmm. one would be through science, and both of these things are perhaps a, a challenge to God or a challenge to our idea of the human spirit, mm -hmm. because it's either challenging God to magic up life or challenging our sense of what's our soul, what's our spirit, what's our mind, if a mechanical thing can look as convincing as we do. And in the end, they really come together to create Olympia, right? They, yeah. Spallanzani is responsible for the Räderwerke, yeah, so all yeah, the mechanical yeah. parts the that mechanics. make her move. Yeah. But then Coppola slash Coppelius yeah. um, are, or is responsible for her eyes, which are somehow supposed to capture the, the innermost layer mm. of her soul and yeah. her life. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, I think this contrast between natural sciences and this earlier magical vision of alchemy yeah, is really interesting so in the, the text. Eyes, the to the soul. Exactly. But yeah, and Nathaniel, when he starts interacting with Olympia, he keeps having this impression that when he looks into her eyes, he can see life somehow springing forth yes, from right. her innermost being. Um, and this brings us back to, to the fact that Nathaniel is really attracted to Olympia. It's not just that he thinks she's, she's, a, she's somebody who's alive, but it's specifically a woman that, yes. that he sees yeah. in her. So I wondered if you could talk a bit mm. more about why you think mm. it's a woman who is this automaton here. Yeah. Well, Olympia is a very attractive woman for somebody like Nathaniel, because what Nathaniel needs, and this is either to do with self-obsession or, in fact, to do with the psychological disturbance that starts in his childhood, but what he needs is someone to listen to him. And this is his overarching need. He has to repeat the childhood stories about Der Sandmann. He has to repeat the stories about Coppelius. He tries to work these stories through in poetry, possibly as a, maybe what you might call now a form of therapy. He tries to work this obsession out in art. Um, now, Clara, his fiance, who's very, um, very intelligent and very insightful and tries her best, I think, to help Nathaniel and, and really loves him and wants him to, to, to be better and to be calmer, um, she thinks his constant repetition of this story is damaging. Mm -hmm. And when he writes a very memorable poem about it. Um, she tells him to throw this poem in the fire because she thinks that would be the best thing to, to get rid of these disturbing memories and cast them away. Um, 
Olympia, of course, on the other hand, can listen to him for hours on end. Um, of course, because she's not really listening at all. So when he speaks to Olympia, what he really gets is a reflection back of himself. He thinks he sees the mirroring of his very soul, the idea that our other half will somehow complement us, but he just sees himself coming back at him. Um, so that's one reason it's important, I think, that she's a, a woman. She, she, If we think of Nathaniel as a, a romantic poet or someone who thinks he's a romantic poet, um, the poet has a desire to reach somebody. Um, and the romantic poets often also have female muses as well, who we don't often hear a lot about. Rather, we hear about their effect on the male poet. So it's, there's something going on here about the relationship between male poets and their muses. Olympia becomes a muse um, for Nathaniel. And this is a bit of a joke, of course, because she doesn't have a heart or a soul or a spirit or any of these qualities we would associate with the muse. Mm -hmm. But he projects them all onto her anyway. So, so would you yeah. say that in a way Olympia becomes this paradigm of feminine passivity that, mm. that somehow the male poet completely fails to notice, which I guess, as you've already been pointing out, gets us into a comparison between Olympia and Clara and what mm. it is that Nathaniel thinks Olympia can give him that yeah. Clara wasn't able to give him. Yeah, what could Olympia give him? Well, the interesting thing is that she, she doesn't really give back anything very original. She says famously one word that she repeats, and it's not even really a word, but an expression. She just says, ah, ah, and she might translate as, oh, oh. So she, she doesn't ever say anything. Um, and this is perhaps, in well, it's, it's definitely in a very stark contrast to Clara, who writes an extremely long and intelligent letter um, Nathaniel writes a letter at the start that he intends her brother Lothar to receive, but he accidentally writes Clara's name on the envelope, so she reads it. Um, and she writes back a very long, insightful and scientifically forward-thinking explanation of what we might now call his psychological condition. Um, and he doesn't like this. He doesn't like this explanation. Um, so she's, she's a rationalist, mm -hmm. Clara. Um, She's not cold-hearted. She's very empathetic, actually, but she comes across as cold-hearted to him because he's not interested in rational explanations. He's interested in the, the spirituality of his own poetry. Mm -hmm. And this is what he thinks Olympia understands because she doesn't contradict him. <laughs> exactly. Um, so from the way we've been talking about Olympia and Clara, it might seem that they have absolutely nothing in mm. common and that they are two opposites. Mm. But I think there are moments in the story where, very interestingly, mm. the language used to describe the two of them gets actually quite yeah. close. Um, yeah. So Nathaniel just seems to use similar language to describe mm -hmm. these two women. So could you talk about some examples? Um, there's a bit, I'm just going to pull it out, where he quite explicitly says mm -hmm. to Clara, du lebloses verdammtes automat, mm -hmm. you lifeless damned automaton. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not actually language he uses to describe Olympia. Mm -hmm. That's how other people end up uh, yeah. describing Olympia. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And um, and that's the moment yeah. when he reads out his long poem to Clara, the one that you've already mentioned, of course, which yeah. is this very dark vision of their wedding mm -hmm. um, that gets interrupted by the Zandman. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she tells him to throw the poem in the fire. That's right. And yeah. to this he reacts by saying, yeah. du late bloses verdammtes automat. So what do you make of it? I, I suppose he thinks that she doesn't have any doesn't have a romantic bone in her body. She doesn't have any artistic understanding. Um, it's, it's an interesting point in the story because the, the poem is extremely disturbing. Um, it takes us back to Nathaniel's childhood. Um, the story of Der Sandman is that if you don't go to sleep at night, the Sandman will come and take out your eyes and feed them to his children on the half moon. So that's there's a, a kind of loss of the eyes becomes a fear of uh, Nathaniel's. And in this poem the Sandman interrupts his and Clara's wedding and Clara's eyes spring out. Um, and at the very end of the story, of course, Olympia's eyes come out when um, Coppola and Spallanzani are fighting over her. 
Um, so that's another point of connection, I think, between Clara and Olympia, this, this idea of, of him imagining them losing their eyes or actually seeing them losing their eyes. Um, yeah. Yeah, and actually at the very end, the very end of the story, so that's after Olympia is um, disclosed to be a machine doll, um, Nathaniel climbs a tower with Clara. Mm. They're supposed to actually get married at this point. Um, and Nathaniel seems to hark back to, to this dark poem mm. about mm -hmm. um, Clara and his wedding with her um, and becomes really disturbed, tries to kill her and keeps calling her Holzpüppchen, yeah, Holzpüppchen, right. um, which is again how he never perceived Olympia, but how everybody else ended yeah. up perceiving yeah, Olympia. Absolutely. Yeah. So what, what do you think it says about Nathaniel that he so grossly miss, mixes, mixes them yeah. up? Or, yeah. or maybe what does it tell us about Olympia and Clara? Um, um, the fact that to him they actually seem to have more in common? Mm. Uh, or on some unconscious yeah. level he perceives them to be more similar? He, he, yeah, absolutely. Um, he, he mixes them up. Um, I suppose we can see that he's... he's He's fallen in love with Olympia. He's absolutely given himself over to her. He sees in her something perhaps that wasn't necessarily there with Clara, um, which is the kind of very reflection of his spirit. She's his other half. And if he's fallen so hard for someone and she turns out not to be real, how can he be sure of anything anymore I mean, there are a couple of moments in the story where he lapses into madness or unconsciousness or is taken off to the um, Irrenanstalt um, only to then recover but this recovery is very much on the surface um, and remember he was about to propose to Olympia yeah. and then this all falls apart when he discovers she isn't real yeah. um, it's all about to come together for Nathaniel and Clara. Clara has forgiven him um, for everything and the fact that he forgot her all this while when he was obsessed with who he thought was another woman. Yeah. And the marriage is about to come together and suddenly this fear arises again. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. I mean, can we blame him? He was so deceived in something that to him seemed so convincing. Um, but the other point, it's again to do with perception. Mm -hmm. So the moment on the tar when he um, compares Clara to a, a, a lifeless wooden doll is um, after he's looked into his, he's got his little spyglass from Coppola still in his coat pocket. Um, Clara draws his attention to something that looks strange down on the ground below, a funny looking little grey bush. Mm -hmm. Um, which turns out not to be a grey bush, but something much more sinister. But instead of using the spyglass to look downwards, um, he looks sideways. And this is interesting too, because he's always looking in a kind of warped way. He never looks at things straight on. He never sees things without some kind of mediation. So it's through a lens or through a lens at a funny angle or through a window. So it, there's something to do with his perception, of course, that's warped. Um, and when he looks at her sideways, i.e. from a kind of warped perspective, this is when he sees her as a doll. And the times that he often he looks at Olympia, as I've said, through a window um, and in, in, in different ways that he doesn't see things as they are. Um, so in both cases, his perception of these two women is really to do with him seeing things from his perspective. Mm -hmm. And as we know, his perspective is one that's based on a long childhood obsession with this horrifying story. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't see clearly, essentially. Yeah. What, so what I find also fascinating about this passage that you just talked about is that when Clara points out this strange moving grey bush to Nathaniel, um, the text says, Nathaniel faste mechanisch nach der Seitentasche to take out his little collapsible telescope. Um, and the word me mechanisch here, so yeah. he reaches mechanically into his pocket. Yeah. Yeah. Of, of course, here in, th in this context, it means something like, you know, without thinking. Mm. But I think it really takes us into this fear that is really mm. underlying the entire story Absolutely. of people acting as machines or people yeah. actually being machines. Absolutely. And it's 
think we could also connect it to this um, to the aftermath of Olympia's the, the discovery that she's a doll when everybody in the town is suddenly really afraid <laughs> that maybe their you know their beloved is also a doll and everybody keeps observing each other when they have tea together to make yeah. sure that nobody here is an automaton passing for a, for a real human being. Yeah. So could you maybe talk a little bit more about this? So the fact that at the very end of the story, this fear of automata really seems to be on everybody's mind. And Absolutely. to some extent, it, we could read it as a fear that is directed towards everybody in the story, not mm. just Olympia, not just Olympia yeah. and Clara, but every character. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this McCarnish is interesting because Nathaniel has always believed um, that the bad things that happen in his life are due to some external power represented by Coppelius slash Coppola. Mm -hmm. Clara's belief is that, that that's not the case, but that if he can sort of conquer his inner demons, as it were... Um, the power of Coppelius would be banished because it's a figment of his imagination. But Nathaniel believes in this external evil force. And actually, it's never clear in the story who's right. Is there an evil external power? It turns out the funny little grey bush is actually Coppelius advancing towards the tower to watch Nathaniel um, come down. Um, so that's one thing. Is, is there some terrifying external force controlling our life? Hoffman lets Clara give a very convincing rational explanation which says no, it's in our mind, but he still leaves the other possibility open. So this mechanish could be the sense that we're all like puppets being controlled beyond our will. But you pointed out also one of my favourite parts, and I'm kind of read it aloud here, but it's one of the funniest bits, I think, in Der Sandman. So there's a nice little moment of light, light and relief. And um, Nathaniel has, has found out the truth about Olympia, and he's taken off to the um, asylum. What's going to happen next? Well, we've got a little moment of light relief that um, lightens the drama before we get back to the story of Nathaniel. And this is a story of what happens to the townspeople after they realise that Olympia is not real. Now, as I've said, they all thought she was a bit odd, but nobody quite realised this. And what happens to relations between men and women? Because it's the women that might not be real. Um, so what do the men do? They set these kind of tests for their girlfriends or the girlfriends try and prove themselves as real women. So this is what happens. Um nun ganz überzeugt zu werden, dass man keine Holzpuppe liebe, wurde von mehreren Liebhabern verlangt, dass die Geliebte etwas taktlos singe und tanze, dass sie beim Vorlesen sticke, strecke mit dem Möpschenspieler und so weiter. Vor allen Dingen aber, dass sie nicht bloß höre, like Olympia, sondern auch manchmal in der Art spreche, dass die Sprechen wirklich ein Denken und empfinden, woraus setzt er. So first of all, in a quite superficial way, women have to prove they're not automata by sometimes getting bored or dancing a bit out of time or yawning when their beloved reads poetry to them. And this proves that they're not just an automaton. More interestingly, I think more, this is where Hoffman or his narrator gets quite critical about the social relations between men and women. They also have to express opinions sometimes, which is exactly what Clara has done, of course, from the start. What happens as a result of these women suddenly expressing their own opinions? Das Liebesbündnis vieler wurde fester und dabei anmutiger, so some relationships get closer and better. Andere dagegen gingen leise auseinander. Man kann wahrhaftig nicht dafür stehen, sagte dieser und jener. Well, we can't stand for this, said some men. So the, the, the men want to be sure that their women aren't robots, mm -hmm. but some of them don't want to be so sure. Um, it's not worth the, the, the price of pen, which is you know having a woman who expresses her own opinion. Mm -hmm. So while we've seen that Hoffman criticizes the relationship between the romantic poet and his muse, there's also a criticism of the kind of bourgeois relations between men and their fiancés, essentially, in, in polite society. And women are expected to listen politely, to, to dance perfectly in time, to exhibit all the graces, but not have too much of a mind going on there anyway. So what's the difference between them and an automata? Well, they just dance a bit out of time and then we can tell. And I just think this is a really funny kind of social critique that, that lightens the mood as well, but adds an extra strand of criticism. Yeah, exactly. So 
we in our conversation we got from the sphere of automata yeah. and this whole discussion in the 18th century, the 19th century mm -hmm. and today about what it is exactly that makes us us, so mm -hmm. what makes us human. Um, but the use of automata in the story also throws up all sorts of other interesting questions such as the relations between men and women mm -hmm. at the time and social expectations of how yeah. women are supposed to behave and what makes an ideal woman. Yeah, um, so it's a very rich topic that yeah. I'm sure we could go on talking yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but we have to wrap up. Okay. So <laughs> thank you very much, Joanna. I really enjoyed our conversation. And for those of you listening or watching us, have a look at our website. We will put the link in the description box below or just search for Oxford German Classic Prize to find out more about our essay competition. We would love to hear your, to read your submissions. And if you enjoyed this episode, check out our other episodes too. But for now, bye-bye and tschüss. <laughs> tschüss. <laughs>